prayer. Let's see if we can hold hands in a big uh, circle or a couple of loops or something. Mm. Lord Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your presence among us this evening. We are here, Lord, to study your word, to see who you are, and to know what we are to do in our lives going forward. We thank you, Lord, for coming into this world, for revealing yourself in the pages of your word. And we pray that you lift us up so that we can see you better and better over time. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right. Thank you, friends. Oh, I'm so excited. Um, all right. I've placed a phrase up here. Hey there, Stephen. Thank you for coming. And um, this is an interesting phrase. Um, uh, first, first of all, let me say a little bit about the Nunclicate Bible Study. This is called the Nunclicate Bible Study because it's a Bible study from a new church perspective. And uh, strange to say, I don't know of a lot of Bible studies from a new church perspective. It, it's not something that's been done a whole lot. We're not like... Protestant or other churches where you get together, you know, once at least or more than that every week and, and study the Bible for hours and things like that. And uh, so it, it's it's a fun thing. It's, its primary purpose is to experience the presence of the Lord through the Word. Uh, secondary purpose is to see new church teachings taught in the pages of Scripture uh, and be able to, you know, read what Swedenborg has to say and then set that aside, pick this up and see, do we see this for ourselves in the pages of Scripture. And uh, it's very rewarding. And we read in here not only the sort of New Church canonical works, uh, but also non-canonical works like the Acts and Epistles. You might even hear the word Ezra tonight. <laughs> and um, so we, we, um, we, we look at the, the whole Bible. And one thought in this for me is that... Um, you know, it, by reading the Bible, we're not necessarily, we don't look at it in the same way that that other people may. I'm not trying to make a big us and them, but I'm just saying there are lots of different views of, of the Bible. Uh, but we are literally reading the same page, at least. You know, you, you're reading the same book. And so I'm very interested uh, in some of the earlier Bible sessions uh, we were talking about. It really struck me in reading the Acts uh, especially, but also the epistles, that the early Christians had to make a case for Christianity using the Old Testament. And they didn't have anything but the Old Testament. There was nothing written down yet. And that was how they made their case. They didn't say, hang on, we're going to write some really great Gospels in another 20 years and uh, read those. Those will really tell you how the whole thing works. They just, hey there, come on in. Uh, they, they just had to present everything on the basis of the Old Testament that they had. In some ways, they had a much more difficult challenge than the new church has. If the new church is trying to present a new church perspective using the New Testament or the Old and New Testaments, at least we've got words in there like Jesus and you know repentance and, and things like that. Uh, when you're trying to argue Christianity from the Old Testament, wow, you know, it's just, it's just a, a real challenge. And yet that's how Christianity got started, was by arguing that. And I read a statement the other day in uh, one of Swedenborg's memorable relations that said that the Word is the only common source from which all Christians draw teachings. And that really struck me, common source, because I feel very unusual as a, as a Swedenborgian, as a new church person. I feel like, well, I don't really want to tell people that I read the Bible, I read the Word, but I've got these other books that I read. When I read that, it suddenly hit me like a ton of bricks. Well, the Calvinists have Calvin's Institutes. Lutherans have the Book of Concord. Catholics have the Council of Trent. The, you know, the, the, uh, whoever they are, the Anabaptists have the Belgic Confessions and the Synod of Dort. And the, everybody's got their book. We're not strange. Everybody's got their extra books that they read. The Word is the only common source from which all Christians draw their Scripture or their teachings. 
And so it behooves us to get on that common source and be able to have a, a conversation of some kind with others and for our own sake. I, I just find it immensely rewarding. I, I really love this uh, Bible study and I'm very uh, moved that you uh, care to join me. It's a nice thing. Um, so, Swedenborg, have you seen this phrase in Swedenborg's writings? God of heaven and earth. He says, God of heaven and earth. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, it's fine if you don't know this. Uh, but I'm hoping that everyone will have some idea of it by the time we're done this evening. Uh, there's a particular phrase that Swedenborg uses in connection with this. Uh, there, there are several phrases, but do you know a phrase? Does any phrase come to mind? What, there's something that comes before this, and there's something that comes after it. Who is that? It says, yeah, it often just says, the Lord. It often says, the Lord is God of heaven and earth. Or the Lord is the God of heaven and earth. That's what they often say. The Lord is God of heaven and earth. And then, do you know what the tag phrase is that often comes afterwards? The Lord is God of heaven and earth as he himself taught. As he himself taught. The Lord is God of heaven and earth as he himself taught. So, who do we take him to mean by Lord there? We've already had the answer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Where does he teach? Where does Jesus say in this book, I'm the God of heaven and earth? There's one scripture in specific. There's sometimes a couple of more, but Swedenborg uses this phrase 175 times, which is a lot for Swedenborg. And um, even in all those pages, it, it's, a, it's a lot of occurrences. And um, he has one scripture that he, he cites. Just one verse. One verse in one chapter that he consistently cites. Do you know, friends, what that verse is? The Lord is God of heaven and earth as he himself taught. Bang! What is the verse? Any of you know the answer? I suspect it's in John. It is actually uh, Matthew 28:18. And uh, if you're not that good with numbers, and uh, I often forget numbers and things like that, they all seem the same to me. Uh, uh, it's the very end of Matthew. So if you're ever in a scramble and you're in a conversation with somebody and you don't know where to look at this, look at the end of Matthew. Matthew 28 is the last chapter. Verse 18 is the third to last verse. And there are three verses at the end where Jesus, he's already resurrected. He's been through the crucifixion. He's resurrected now, and uh, Matthew 28, 18, let's have a look at that. I've got the uh, old King James, and it's fine, whatever you've got, the differences in translation. And Jesus came and spake unto them. Now, this is the verse. This is Swedenborg's testimony. This is the foundation on which the whole thing is built. The Lord is God of heaven and earth as he himself taught. Boom, here it is. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Uh, you New King James people will have the word authority in there. And it probably says on her earth, doesn't it? In heaven and on earth. Uh, but authority, power, Greek exousia, same thing. Uh, interesting phrase. Interesting phrase. Uh, he didn't say, literally, I am the God of heaven and earth. Did he? You can see how it's related. The heaven part and the earth part, yes, we get a big yes on that. The God part, it didn't say. But it did say all power or all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So, um, and then the next verse is a very crucial verse. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Interesting, it's a therefore. 
This is what you should do about that. Here's what to do about that. Teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, or the end of the age in the New King James. These are his parting words. Now, part of what fascinates me about the fact that Swedenborg uses this, especially in Apocalypse Revealed, that comes up again and again and again and again and again and again and again. That's what the whole message is about. That the Lord is God of heaven and earth, as he himself taught, Matthew 28, 18. Comes up again and again and again. What's interesting about it is that people who believe in a trinity of persons, what is the cornerstone of that position? It's Matthew 28, 19. And that's the cornerstone of the position that there's a trinity. Because nowhere else in Scripture, there are some other passages you can point to that talk about the Father and the Word and the, and the, and the Spirit and so forth. And you, at the baptism of Jesus, you have the Father says something and there's the Son and the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove. You know, but actually, <clears throat> there's lots of sense of more than oneness about God in Scripture. But just a clear, plain old trinity... This is your smoking gun Trinity passage. Because it speaks of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? It's crystal clear. Isn't it fascinating that a Trinitarian, three persons view of the Godhead uses the verse after the verse that Swedenborg uses to say, the Lord is God of heaven and earth as he himself taught. Matthew 28, 18. Uh, so, there are differing views of this, these verses here, as we've discussed before. Some of you have heard me talk about this before. Um, well, there are a couple of interesting things in here. First of all, let's look at that verse 20 there. All, pow- all power, we're going to talk more about all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. But look at that 20th, 20th verse there. Shouldn't it have said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever we have commanded you? Might it also not have said in verse 9, baptizing them in the names of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? But it's a singular name. It's one name. And teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, says the Lord. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, or the end of the age. It doesn't say we are. There's no we in there. There's just an I. Okay. Uh, now, if you think about that statement, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth, It's interesting that he would immediately say, baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, when, according to what he just articulated, apparently the Father has no power in heaven, and the Father has no power on earth, and the Holy Spirit has no power in heaven, and the Holy Spirit has no power on earth, so why bother with him? Do you know who's got all power in heaven and earth? It's Jesus. Why bother with the other two? You know, unless he's fudging around with the language or something. He just said all power. He didn't say a third of the power, a little bit of the power. All power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, obviously, there's got to be some more than oneness because he said is is given. He didn't start out with it. He got it, right? He he inherited it. Uh, Okay, next thing we need to look at is um, in Acts... Uh, chapter 2, there's the day of Pentecost. And everybody's waiting around. And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes down with divided tongues that are flame-like and, and people start to speak and everybody hears them. There are thousands of people gathered there for the feast and they hear them speaking in their own language. And they're just absolutely astonished. And some people are saying they're drunk and so forth. Have a look at Acts, which is after the Gospel of John there. We're looking at chapter 2 which is with the day of Pentecost. I'm just giving you one example. Uh, But Acts chapter 2, 
Then Peter gets up and he gives this phenomenal speech. And it's exactly like what I was just talking about. He quotes the Old Testament. He quotes the Psalms. He seems to have them on the tip of his finger. Look, that passage from the Psalms that we all know, that was all about Jesus. And so on and so forth. And he gets very bold. This is not Peter 1.0 who denied the Lord. You know, this is Peter 2.0 who's very bold and doesn't back down from anybody. And uh, he's quoting all this, and then he speaks about Jesus, and he finally says to them all, Let all the house of Israel know, this is verse 36, that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, it's bold, tell a whole group of assembled Jews, you crucified him, and, uh, you know, both Lord and Christ, God made him both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They've just heard this powerful message. It's interesting that in Matthew 28 there, the Lord says, All power is given to me on heaven and earth. And then the next thing is, Therefore, here's what to do. You know, you know it's really the word, and you know it's coming from the Lord if there's a here's what to do attached to it. Because He doesn't tell you things just for the sake of, you know, your fascination in an idle hour. He, he, he wants to transform us. So they ask, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now here's his big chance. You've got this whole group of people, what shall we do? And what does Peter tell them to do? There's two things that are fascinating about this. What's the first word out of his mouth? Repent. Repent. Before anything, repent. Repent. Now you know that Matthew 3, verse 2, that the first word out of John the Baptist's mouth in his ministry is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, 17, the first word out of Jesus' mouth in his ministry, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what's interesting about this, new church people are not surprised by his saying that. But think about it. From the point of view of a lot of Christians in the world, again, I'm not trying to do a big S in them, but but uh, the point that, that other teaching says that Jesus' death on the cross took away the sins of the world. Why would Peter say, you know, what should we do? Isn't that the perfect opportunity to Peter to say, there's nothing you have to do. It's awesome. It's all been taken care of for you. No more sin. Say you believe. You know, I'll baptize you and we're done. And he doesn't say anything of the kind. First word, repent. And what is the second thing he says? And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. The New Testament speaks several times about a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. A baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Here you've got repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And... Peter made a mistake, didn't he? He failed to follow the Lord's clear instructions. Baptize them all in the name of what? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very clear teachings. Whoops, Peter messed up. He said, baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, he was sitting right there. Could he not hear what the Lord said? And repeatedly in Acts, people get baptized in the name of Jesus, and they never, friends, never get baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Never. Now, did they just not hear well? There's two explanations. The disciples are still idiots, as we know they were, and they're blowing it. And it's recorded how they blow it. The other possibility is that Jesus Christ is the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the other possibility. Right? And they're following instructions. They're baptizing him in the name contains all the quality. Right? Jesus Christ is the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're obeying orders. They're doing it right. There are multiple passages that I could take you through. But... All right. Uh, So anyway, that's a little riff on the end of Matthew there. Uh, What I want to do 
is uh, let's okay God of heaven and earth I want to go back to 28.18 Matthew 28.18 and the God of heaven and earth yes please do please do Yeah, um, that's right. That's right. In the in the statement um, at the beginning of uh, TCR or True Christianity, the number one point about the new church is there is one God, the divine Trinity exists within Him, and He is the Lord God, the Savior Jesus Christ. It does put the whole thing. It's got Lord. It's got God. It's got Savior. It's got Jesus. It's got Christ. That that's the that's the sort of full name. Now, the, in the New Church, it does say right in our canon number 14, which is the first book that Swedenborg published of a theological nature, it says right there that in the heavens they use the term Lord without additional names, and that's what I'm going to follow that practice. And so he does make a statement, and the New Church has largely followed him in that. But there's a statement in the Philippians that Swedenborg echoes, I think, in True Christianity, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. You know, that's not a bad name. That's not a bad name. That's been abused. That name has been taken in vain and it's been misunderstood and so forth. But the name, as you know, means Jah saves or Jah is the Savior. The Old Testament God is the Savior. He cleverly disguised his identity in a name that spells it out in crystal clear terms. Jah is the Savior. Hello, you know. <laughs> Old Testament God is, is the Savior. Um, but I agree, it's interesting that there has been kind of a... I think because of all that, all that association from all this Christian teaching, which we don't agree with, that uses those names so heavily. But, uh, but they are... Distinct, making a distinction in the I guess so. You know, in the baptism and in weddings and so forth, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. But you don't have Jesus Christ without the Lord at the beginning, usually in the neutral. You know, you don't hear much about that. Or you don't hear Lord Jesus or Christ Jesus or these other, or lots of other names in the New Testament that, that we don't use much. Tamar. Nice uh, closure to this, which is not suggesting that you move on to a different subject at all. <laughs> but is with all of the, the different phrases... I'm, I'm hearing from our, the New Church baptism, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. It's that's how they handle it, and that's how they bring it together. That's right. That's what the baptism is. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so um, the... Uh, so in Matthew 28, 18... Uh, Jesus says, all power has been given to me in heaven and earth. And Swedenborg says that that's where he's announcing that he's the God of heaven and earth. So, uh, here's a, a, a pop quiz that's even harder than the last one. <laughs> does Scripture, does the Old New Testament, including non-canonical works, ever use the term God of heaven and earth? Does it ever use that term? God of heaven and earth. It's not a very familiar... What's that? What's that? Our Father. Our Father, that's right. I want to talk about that some more later on tonight. That's right. We definitely have the Father in the heavens. Comes up. <laughs> you certainly find them in the context of each other, but just that sound bite. Uh, the answer to the little quiz is it only occurs once, and it's in a work that Swedenborg considers non-canonical. And this is where Ezra comes in. Now, I defy you to find Ezra in your Old Testament. 
um, he's between, he's before Nehemiah, and he's after Second Chronicles. So we're at, we're talking about after First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. All right. Then Ezra and then Nehemiah. So it's about a quarter of the way through the book, or something like that. I didn't know this yesterday, but I just found this out this morning. It's kind of a fun little. It's kind of fun to think that this. I don't know if Swedenborg got this phrase from here, or whether it was just something everybody in his time period was saying. But it's interesting that he would use a phrase 175 times that only appears in the Bible once, and then only in Ezra. You know. So look at Ezra chapter five, verse 11. See if you have the same thing in your Bible there. And thus they returned us answer, saying, We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. There it is. The God of heaven and earth. And build the house that was built these many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and set up. Already my correspondence mind starts to tick, 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 tick with the temple and Jesus and so forth. You know, he likens himself to the temple and so forth. Uh, um, but there it is, the God of heaven and earth. Uh, there are two other passages uh, which we can look at real quick, which are interesting in this regard. I think it's Matthew 11:25. So Matthew is the first of the Gospels in the New Testament. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Matthew 11:25. This is an interesting passage. Now see, that Matthew 28, 18 is not the only time that Jesus says things like, all power has been given to me. There are some other passages, and sometimes Swedenborg gives some of the other passages, and some we can just find on our own. But if you look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, who would be willing to read just three verses for me? Go ahead. Oh, Lord of heaven and earth. It's not God of heaven and earth, but it's Lord of heaven and earth. So the phrase Lord of heaven and earth does occur in the canonical New Testament. Lord of heaven and earth. Okay, Lord of heaven and earth. Go on. Because you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seems good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. Oh, what was that? <laughs> Say that again. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. Oh, is that like all power has been given unto me in heaven and on earth? <laughs> Seems like an echo, an interesting little echo, two verses after Lord of heaven and earth. All things have been delivered to me of my Father. Again, there's the sense that they weren't at the, to begin with. Like there was some time before this handing over occurred. But now the Lord is saying they have been, this is even before he's crucified, but they have been delivered to me of my Father. Go ahead and just finish it out there. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and he to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Okay, thank you. And that, those were the verses I wanted to read. The, the um, It's a beautiful sense there. You know, again, the first time we read this from a new church standpoint, we think the Son and the Father, so, oh, I don't like the two-ness of it. But when you think about truth, and the, uh, if any of you were here last week, the diagram I did of how truth contains the, the love inside. And the love is the Father, and then the truth is the Son that contains that. Uh, and, and the Lord came in the flesh. So that's how we have access to Him. So the Lord is, Jesus is the one who reveals to us the Father. Uh, he's the one who reveals to us the Father. And um, I think this is another one. Have a look at Acts. So Acts is after John. Let me see if I'm right. Yes! Oh, it's another good one. The context is something... I just It just drives me ape sometimes. Uh, it's just amazing how you find a statement like this and you read a few verses back and forth and you find something that's a lot... I don't know. It's, I can't put it into words. Uh, would you be willing to read some more? Sure. 
Acts chapter 17, and we're starting in verse 24. This is a fascinating, fascinating passage that I, I won't go into now, but Paul is talking to the Athenians, and he's talking about the uh, tomb of the unknown God and so forth. Uh, not the tomb, sorry, the, the um, whatever it is, the temple of the unknown God. Think of the tomb of the unknown soldier, but that's something entirely different. Uh, go ahead in verse 24. Oh, there it is again. Lord of heaven and earth. So he's Lord of heaven and earth. He made everything. He's Lord of heaven and earth. Interesting that Paul would use that phrase to a bunch of Greek Gentiles. They're not Jews. They're not Christians. You know, go on. Does not dwell in temples made with hands. Temples come up again here. Interesting, huh? Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. How far? Keep going. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre appointed times and boundaries of their habitation, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Thank you. I'd like to stop there, but I wanted to get that phrase, that in him we live and move and have our being, which is such a beautiful phrase. Swedenborg quotes that a lot without necessarily even citing the verse that it comes from. But it's obviously a favorite of his. In the Lord, there's something about God of heaven and earth, and in him we live and move and have our being. Uh, that, that is related. And maybe we'll be able to come back to that. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. Let's read some more scriptures. Uh, have a look at Daniel, which is back in the Old Testament, one of the major prophets, so-called. It's after Ezekiel. So it's sort of more than halfway through the Bible, actually. This is not an overwhelming statement. This is very subtle. But I just thought of that same passage in Matthew 28, 18. Some of how I arrive at these things is that when I'm reading in the morning, as I may have described to you, uh, friends, I'm not saying you should read the same way, but this is just the way the Lord has me doing it these days, is that I do a lot of cross-referencing. I, you know, as I read, I'll see something that echoes something else I read, and I'll just mark it in the margins. And so this is how some of these things came to me. It was just like, oh, that's... I was reading through Daniel, and I saw this passage, like... That's like Matthew 28, 18, you know? There's something a little reminiscent. It's, it's, it's not thundering, it's just whispering, but, but I like it. It's Daniel 6, verses 26 and 27. I'll read it in the old King James. Now, this is King Darius after Daniel's done this amazing thing. You know, he's been rescued from the lion's den and so forth. And he makes a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. That's a beautiful phrase, isn't it? The living God. He is the God of Daniel, is the living God, and steadfast forever, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. Uh, I just have to mention that right over the page in Daniel 7, uh, verse 14, I think it is, is the verse that Swedenborg puts on the title page of true Christianity, because that's the one that says that the Lord is coming and his kingdom will be forever and so forth. So we're right in that same ballpark here. And then in verse 27, this is the verse that just struck me. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. And part of what I like about that is that this God, this living God, who I can't help but think is the Lord, you know, it's Jesus that he's talking about in anticipation, uh, has this power. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. In both realms, just like saying all power is given to him in heaven and on earth. And uh, he has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Uh, Isn't that a wonderful little summary of redemption? 
you know, I mean, we all have lions that pursue us, and and uh, he's the one who has power in heaven and on earth to to rescue us from from the lions. Oh, another underwhelming passage is uh, Romans. So this would be the first of the epistles. It's right after the Acts in the New Testament. Right after the Acts. A very, very brief phrase, but it really struck me. really struck me when, one night when I was reading this. The problem with uh, quoting the epistles is that Paul is generally in, <laughs> in the course of an 18-verse sentence. <laughs> so you never get a subject and a verb and an object. You know, you just sort of cut in through a subordinate clause and then you cut back out before you even get to the main verb, you know, or something. But anyway, we just have to live with it. But um, it's very fun reading that way. I mean, preachers love it because it's a real discourse and so forth. But if you look at Romans 9, verse 5, I was just interested in this phrase... Romans 9, verse 5. Whose are the fathers? And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, and here's the phrase, who is over all. What do you have in your translation? Is that what you have? Who is over all. Isn't that the same as saying God of heaven and earth in, in a way? He's over all. He's over all. God blessed forever. Amen. And uh, so that was just a brief little visit to the Romans. Uh, Now turn with me, if you would, to uh, Isaiah 54. (laughs) Isaiah gets me so excited. I just have a lot of... uh, Every time I dip my head in Isaiah, it's just an amazing book. So I'm looking at Isaiah, which is right in the middle of your Bible, just about as the biggest of the major prophets there in the Old Testament. Looking at Isaiah chapter 54. Now this is back in the Old Testament. This is a prediction looking forward to when the Lord would come into the world. And what does it say here? Let's pick up at, uh, oh, I just have to pick up at verse uh, 1 here. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. It just reminds me of the tabernacle of God is with men and there's these beautiful things that, that are said in the Old Testament about the stretching and it'll be a tent that's set up and you'll never take down the cords and no one will ever take the stakes out. And, you know, it's about the new church and so forth. Um, For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left and thy seed, singular, seed singular, thy seed singular shall inherit the Gentiles. It's a beautiful phrase. You know, the Lord is going to inherit the Gentiles, people who haven't even heard of Him. Thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. So this is talking about some beautiful time in the future when the church is going to be married to the Lord. For thy Maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name and thy redeemer. Here we have it again. Isaiah so often says it, where the Lord of hosts, when you see Lord in small caps like that, that's Jehovah, that's the Old Testament God. Here the Lord of hosts is thy redeemer. The Lord is, Jehovah of the Old Testament is the redeemer of the New Testament. Thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. That's related to God of heaven and earth, is it not? We're getting a little closer here. Okay. And we've just got a few more scriptures along these lines. If you can turn forward to the Gospel of John. Uh, 
These are passages in my mind that are related to the God of heaven and earth passage. So in other words, although Swedenborg keeps referring to Matthew 28, 18, it's not the only passage. You know, if somebody came by at night and took that out of your Bible, you would have other verses <laughs> that you could still argue this from. Okay, John 3, verse 35. We're just going to shoot through a few verses real quick. The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into His hand. Isn't that the same thing that we're talking about? Has given. Again, they weren't always there. They were somewhere else or whatever, but they have been (laughs) given into His hand. This is this kind of sense of transfer of power. Turn forward uh, to John 13. We have four verses in John. John 13, verse 3. This is coming into the Last Supper. And this wonderful sort of participial phrase, John 13, verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands... And that he was come from God and went to God. He rises from supper and laid aside his garments and so forth. He knows that the Father's given all things into his hands. So Matthew 28, 18 is not alone in saying that Jesus was given uh, things by the Father. And then look at uh, John 16, verse 15. John 16 is another chapter that just makes me crazy. It's wonderful. John 16, verse 15. All things that the Father hath are mine. Now that's a little different, isn't it? Because God the Father still has them. Even though they've been given to Jesus, it's not like the Father had to give them up. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. And one more, right over the page. John 17, verse 2. Uh, Actually, we'll start in verse 1, because Jesus is saying this prayer. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. And thou hast given him power over all flesh. Thou hast given him power over all flesh. Well... Um, okay. If we had to graph it, if we think about what Swedenborg says about the spiritual world, God is like the what in the spiritual world? Sun. He's like the sun. That's right. Is God... Is God in heaven or is he above heaven or both he's in heaven apart he's in heaven apart from heaven good answer good answer (laughs) he's in all time apart from time in all space apart from space that's right that's right Uh, God is above heaven let's look at this all right Turn all the way back to the historical works. Have a look at 1 Kings, another chapter that I just love and love and love, and the Lord keeps taking me back there. 1 Kings, chapter 8. This is the dedication of what? The temple. The temple. <laughs> it's great. 1 Kings 8, dedication of the temple. And look at 8, verse 27. You've heard this phrase before. Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built. Heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. All right? Okay? Good. Have a look at, we'll look at some stuff in the Psalms, okay? Psalms is more or less in the middle of your Bible, but it's before Isaiah and the Proverbs. And uh, let's look at Psalm 8. We'll just rip through a few of these real fast. Psalm 8, 
Psalm 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is Thy name in all the earth who has set Thy glory above the heavens. His glory is set above the heavens. Okay? Have a look at uh, Psalm 57. Psalm 57... Just looking at verse 5 and 11, there's sort of a refrain in this psalm. 57 verse 5. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. And verse 11. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. Look at Psalm 108. Psalm 108, verses 4 and 5. For thy mercy is great above the heavens, and thy truth reacheth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, and thy glory above all the earth. You see a pattern there and turn to Psalm 113. Verse 4. The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. So where is the Lord as He is? Where is God, the Old Testament God, as He is in Himself? He's above the heavens. Right? Okay. And next question, it's not that he isn't in it. Yes, Dolores. Is that because the Lord is not conjoined, not joined with man, man in heaven, but is conjoined? Is that, is that, so, is that, is that right? Yes. I mean, it, it's, it's the same thing you see, as I may have mentioned last time, when, when John on the Isle of Patmos just he sees a vision of the Lord and he just collapses. You know, he's a disciple, he's been following the Lord, the good person, but he just can't take the presence of the Lord. So the Lord sets, even the heavens are set at a kind of safe distance. They have these atmospheres around them, so everything's tempered. uh, Because the Lord, as he is in himself, that divine love, you know, the divine love says, I want you as close as I can get you. And the divine wisdom says, Not so fast, they'll burn to a crisp. (laughs) And so between the divine love and the divine wisdom, then we're at this distance. And uh, the heavens are are higher than than we are, uh, but there's still this distance. The the writings speak of uh, two degrees of divine truth above the heavens. You know, there's this layers above the heavens. Steve? Uh, Just a simple point as we were reading this. uh, Again, above the heavens, I was just picturing how Stephen Moore talks about the angels in the heavens where the spiritual sun is always above them at a certain point. And just spatially speaking, it makes sense at all. And it's a very simple point. But. That's right. That's right. 45 degree angle is just above them. That's right. It's up up, up above them. And um, <clears throat> so how about uh, Jesus? Have a look at Ephesians. All right. We're into the epistles now. It's all right. It's, it's all right. Uh, the Ephesians <laughs> come after the uh, Romans and then the Corinthians and then Galatians and Ephesians. The epistles up to the Hebrews get shorter and shorter and shorter. They're arranged according to length. So it gets harder and harder to find them. But the Ephesians are right after the Galatians. And if you hit the Hebrews or the Philippians or Colossians, you've gone too far. Okay, Ephesians... Chapter 4, verse 10. Well, this is about Christ. Let's pick up at verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? But he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. You ever heard of the lower earth that Swedenborg talks about? Descended into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended, meaning Jesus, is the same also that ascended up where? 
far above all heavens. Why? That he might fill all things. Jesus, too, is far above the heavens. Very clearly taught here in Ephesians. Jesus is far above the heavens that he might fill all things. So if we had to depict... Uh, do I have a nice... Uh, all right. Let's, let's make the heavens a nice sort of sky blue. But if you had to sort of picture the heavens and they have these beautiful mountains and whatever, just for the sake of the argument. And then down here, you have the earth with the beautiful mountains and, and so forth. And here we are on the earth. And God is far above both of these. The heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. There, Swedenborg says that by appearance, these are as distant from the spiritual sun as we are from our sun. You know, 93 million miles. There's, there's a lot of distance. Let it cool down. Atmospheres to buffer it, to bring it to us, but also just to, you know, make it livable so that we're, we're not just uh, cooked uh, by it. Um, so... Isn't it interesting then? Someone already mentioned it. What is that opening line of the prayer again? Our Father in heaven. In heaven? Our Father in heaven? But you are surely above heaven. Why don't we say, Our Father who art above heaven? Who is our Father in heaven? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. How do we know He's the Father? Don't make me take you back to Isaiah 9, 6 again. <laughs> He's the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That was His name. A son shall be given unto you, and His name is the everlasting Father. And there are other great passages where it says there should be a, he shall be a father to Jerusalem and so forth. He is the father. Uh, so, but why, friends, would we pray to our father in the heaven? Isn't that curious? And isn't it interesting that everything we're talking about is that Jesus is the God of heaven and earth. All power has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. If you happen to wander off the map and find yourself somewhere other than heaven and earth, you know, obviously, the, what the Ephesians said is that Jesus fills all things. He, he fills the whole chart. There's something very beautiful to me about the fact, I mean, he could have, I, what if he didn't care? Or what if, you know, what if like uh, space dust was his favorite thing? Or what if there's somewhere we don't know about that's not earth and not heaven it's somewhere, you know, I mean, there's a lot of something else, right? I guess. There's two degrees of divine truth up above all that. Do you feel the love? This is where we are. That's why he's here, right? This is where, this is where, we, where our outside is. This is where our inside is. This is where we're going. And that, if we get there, that'll be a nice place to be. Yeah, Steve. that's what I was thinking. It, was, uh, it, 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 it puts in a, a relatable sense that and this is part of the point of Christ's coming was to have this relationship established in some way that we get, not just in some abstract above everything <coughs> this, you know. And so it sums it up right in there. Our Father who are in the heavens, in the space that we can relate it. Yes, that's right. That is an accessible, even though to some degree... 
if you're down here, you say you're higher than we are. You know, you're praying to someone who's higher than you are, and yet it still is in a realm that's comprehensible or, or, or whatever you would say. Our Father in the heavens. And <clears throat> some of you were here in a Bible study a few weeks ago, and we talked about the end game. What was the end game? You remember what the end game was? The, the Father, I mean you, you be me. Yes. Yeah. We read all the way too many scriptures, right? We read like 62 <laughs> verses in one night or something uh, that all talked about that the Lord wants to be in us and us in the Lord. You know, I'll come in and dine with them and they with me and so on. Uh, that the Lord wants to be with us in this reciprocal <coughs> relationship. So, do we presume that those in the heavens are in this relationship? In fact, what Swedenborg teaches about this is that they use the you know the old tr- wonderful translations say the divine. What do they say? Something like the divine of the Lord constitutes the heavens. The angels merely populated or something like that. What's it's, <laughs> right? Something like that. The heavens are the heavens because these are the presence of the Lord. You're you're in you're in the Lord. It even relates to what Paul says about how the church is the body of Christ. And so in some sense, you are in. I mean, we have two choices. We have a very real choice that we can make. We can be in the Lord or we can be on our own and take our chances. You know? Bottom line, that's sort of the the choice that we have. We can be in the Lord, in which case we're safe because that presence of the Lord just drives evil away. It can't stand it. It's like the wall of water to the left and the wall of water to the right, and you're protected in the middle because the Lord is is present with you. Evil can't stand it. can't get near it. If you move into the Lord, you are going to be so fine. You're going to be fine. You know? And uh, all that stuff about the warfare, her warfare is ended. You know? Uh, They... The interior battle will eventually come to an end. The schizophrenia and everything that we suffer while we're here in this world, spiritually speaking, you know? The war in our members, between different parts of ourselves. I hope we get to talk about it another time. Uh, So this really is sort of an extension. It's not where he is as he is in himself, but it's an extension of the Lord in which the angels dwell. And they're in that human form. They're, They're in the form of the Lord. There's a very beautiful teaching uh, that I love in Heaven and Hell. I edited the whole book. We published it. I never remember seeing this phrase in there. We read it so many times. I never remember seeing this phrase. But later, I read this phrase that says, When the Lord appears in heaven. And that's a nice beginning of a sentence. I could just stop there because that's a nice thought, isn't it? When the Lord appears in heaven, He does not appear as a king with an entourage. Walking along, you know, come friends and all the, you know, the courtiers and, you know, the magnates and the dignitaries and so forth are walking along with him. That is not how he appears. When the Lord appears among angels, when the Lord appears in heaven, he does not appear as a king with an entourage, but as one angel. So what happened to all the other people? They got absorbed into him. He says, come. Be part of me. Be my hands. Be my elbows. Be part of me. You know? Come in. Come into me. Come unto me. Come into me. Be. Let's just be together. Isn't that fun? Yeah. So the Lord comes into a group of people and he goes, Phoom. and then we're all, we're all one. He makes us, well, he's the one-izer. <laughs> he makes us one. And, um, so that's what this is. The whole heaven is that it's not a king with his entourage. It's that you get to play a part. You get to be in him. This is what he wants. No good thing shall he withhold from those who walk upright. You know, he wants to give you the full package. If he could stand it, he'd give you all the infinity and all the stuff that would tear, tear, your, tear your mind out. But um, uh, he wants to give you everything. And... Uh, so this presence of the Lord is, this is the presence of the Lord. That's what constitutes it. If you ask the angels, you say, oh, you guys are cool, and you like, you're heaven, right? You guys, you all get together, and you're heaven. 
What would they say? There's, I am not heaven. Have you talked to my wife? I am not heaven. You know? But the Lord is heaven, and I get to be in the Lord. The Lord is heaven. That, that's, who, that's who heaven is. You know? So, um, I, I just have this perverse desire to ask you another question, good friends. Do you know, uh, I know some of you know, what Swedenborg's favorite, what is his favorite ever? So let, let, let's have a little time. Let's have a little quiz. Uh, what is, uh, what is the scriptural basis for Swedenborg's oft-repeated statement that the Lord is the God of heaven and earth. The Lord is the God of heaven and earth, as he himself said. And how would you find it if you couldn't remember the number? It's at the end of Matthew. Just go to the end of Matthew. That's it. That's very good. See, that's great. That's good. All right, this is a trickier one. Some of you know the answer. What are Swedenborg's two absolute all-time favorite verses from the epistles. From the epistles. He has two favorite, favorite verses. What are his two favorite verses from the epistles? Go ahead. Uh, is one of them the in him we live and move and have our being? Uh, that would be number three. That's good. That's good. Good try. That's very good, though. That, that was definitely... Shun equals a sin. The passage I'm thinking of is Colossians 2, verse 9. So Colossians is after the Ephesians, if you're still turned there. All right, so Colossians come right, at, right after the Philippians. They're getting smaller and smaller as you work your way in toward the Hebrews there. Colossians 2, verse 9. I think it's true that in the first volume of TCR, he quotes this 12 times. 12 times in seven chapters. And he alludes to it more than that, I believe. And I, and I may be, may be lowballing you there. Um, Colossians 2, verse 9. Look at the end of verse 8. That's who we're talking about, Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now that is a powerful statement. In Christ, this is supposed to be Mr. Trinity, in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So, um, you were communicated with about this Bible study. And because my office is next to Cara Doms, I happen to know how she did this. She wrapped a fancy headscarf around her head. She lit eight candles. And she got out a crystal ball and she raised your spirits. Oh, spirits of the Bible study. <laughs> Wednesday night at 7.30. Come to Bible study. No. Actually, her body communicated with your body. Via the internet. Right? She didn't have a seance. If you want to talk to me, Find my body. When you think about it, it's an amazing deal. Because we're probably not all in the same place in the spiritual world. Right? You might be here, you might be there, you might be here, I'm over there. We're, we're all different places. It's almost like email. I mean, all she does is she types in your address and it gets to you and nobody knows how. <laughs> right? Nobody knows how. But it goes all over the place and boom, and it comes into your inbox. And the same thing happens between... Our bodies and our, our spirit. We don't even know where our spirits I don't even know how it works. Our spirits are somewhere. They may be wherever. You know, they may be running. They may be sleeping. They, you know, whatever. And, and but we're connected with them. Wherever they are and everything that they are. They may be multiple things or whatever. But they all get communicated with through these little crummy things that we wear around in public. You know, these bodies that we wear. And it's amazing that your, that your body communicates with your spirit. And yet that's how communication takes place. And if I want to affect your spirit, 
if I hope that this Bible study affects your spirit, I want to have my body in the room with your body, and I'll make noises, and they will affect your spirit. Wherever your spirit is, you know, if you're not absolutely fast asleep, you know, chances are it'll go in and have some impact on you, in, in your spirit. It's amazing that we can have this kind of, so actually a wonderful system. When you think about it, it's kind of amazing. We're all these little sort of spirit folders, a little folder for my spirit. All the memories, all the feelings, all of everything, you know, here's my little spirit folder. And yet it's just this little thing. doesn't take much room. You can fit several of them in a single car. <laughs> and yet it's hooked up with your spirit, wherever it is, and it can communicate with your spirit. If you want to communicate with God, car has got a leftover headscarf. You could wrap it around your head. You get out a crystal ball and go, Oh God, oh Spirit of the Most High. But that would be stupid. It would be equally as stupid as trying to commune with our spirits in order to communicate Bible study information. Much more efficient to go through the body. And who is the body of the Godhead? In Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So it solves your communication problem. You know? All power has been given to him in heaven and earth. What's the other favorite scripture? Before, before we leave that, yes, yes, please. Can you comment on the, the use of the word God? And why not just God by itself? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it does point to the fact that there's more than one moving part in there. Right. Yes. It seems almost like it's throwing you slightly off the scent. Yes. And yet, from a neutral standpoint, it's true. Like we talked about last time, it's very important, actually, that there are three, because you don't fully understand the whole thing if you don't have three in there. It's not simply so one one that there's not different parts that did different things. This, this Jesus who came down and became glorified and is now the God of heaven and earth and is our Father in the heavens makes a big difference uh, to us. And so I think the, the, I mean, Paul met Jesus personally. He got lifted up to the third heaven. He heard ineffable things. He knew what he was talking about. And, uh, and yet he constantly uses this kind of Trinitarian language, but he tips his hand here and there by saying something like, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But Godhead is like, so if Godhead is presumably the Father and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and all that, and and we can kind of relate because all that we are dwells bodily in us, wherever it is spiritually. It dwells bodily in us. And it's interesting that he says this after Christ was risen. You know, and yet he still speaks of a body. And Paul speaks elsewhere. There's a natural body and a spiritual body. You know, very clear teaching that there's such a thing as a spiritual body. What's that? Huh. Yeah. I've always thought of it as sort of shorthand for the Trinity, but but I don't know. I you know, I don't know. It's a great question. It's a great question. I'm afraid I have, because of all the sort of um, time and space thinking that I suffer from, I have a very strange picture that the that the word, in a sense, is a book on the outside and a person on the inside. That's kind of the, it's a very time and space way of thinking about it. But I think of it being a book on the outside, but there's a mind, a living mind in there, and a mind that can wink at you. I don't know if you've had this experience, but it can. You know, sometimes I've done that thing. That I, I wouldn't say that I recommend it highly, but sometimes I will um, flip the Bible with my eyes closed and then just poke my finger in and see what verse I get. I may be hurting or something, and I'll get something wonderful like, 
you blasphemer, you rotter, you, you know. It's something uplifting like that. What did I get? And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem, and the king went up into the house of the Lord. Oh, that's a nicer word. Good. That must be in a better state right now. Uh, oh, I've had some very, very poignant ones that are just so like making it worse, you know. Uh, but, um, but I do think the book communicates. And there have been times when I've been having a terrible problem, really at the end of my rope, absolutely end of my rope. And I remember at one point turning open Jeremiah and reading a whole chapter in there, and there was absolutely nothing in that chapter that was literally anything to do with my problem. My problem had to do with clutter in the house and disorder and you know and stuff that needed to be taken care of. There was absolutely nothing in that chapter that had anything to do with it. And yet after reading that chapter, I knew exactly what I needed to do. It gave me ex- I never seen it so clearly that it just sort of, oh, let's get the book out of the way and I'll just talk to you. You know, thank you for reading and we'll just get the book out of the way and I'll, I'll talk to you right now kind of thing. And tell, tell you what you need to know. So I think of it, it may be a silly way to think of it, but I think of a book as the outside of it, but it's a living person who actually does. And it's fun that first moment. I mean, I remember the first moment that I thought it was talking to me. You know, it's sort of like overhearing this conversation. Like your parents talking in the next room or something. Back, forth, back, forth. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, you hear your name or, you you know, uh, only this was even different. It was uh, Joshua chapter 1 where he says, uh, don't be afraid, go into the land, I'm with you, don't turn to the left or the right, and, and you shall prosper and everything, be, be of good courage and, and uh, you know, and all that stuff. And I suddenly, one day, just realized it's not that it wasn't talking to Joshua, but it was also talking to, to me. You know, it was talking directly. I hadn't had that experience before. Suddenly I realized, Oh, it's kind of startling and wonderful when when you realize it, it's talking about it's talking about you. Um, so uh, the other scripture. Anybody know what the other scripture is, Kara? Well, it's another wrong guess, but is it something about the through a glass darkly or something? No, it's a good one. It's a good one. No, that's another. That's probably number four. Favorite. Uh, it is First John five verse twenty, and it's kind of a fun one. Now, the epistles of John, the first John. This is these are the epistles of John. They come very shortly before the book of Revelation. They just have Jude in between, and he's very short. First uh, John five, and it comes right at the end of first the epistle of First John. And this is Swedenborg's other favorite verse from the epistles. And yet, I don't know if it's divine, divine sense of humor or what it is, but Swedenborg can never give the reference correctly. Even when he's quoting angels giving the verse, they give the wrong verse. You know, he just always, or at least he gives a range of verses. That he gives verse 21 and it doesn't say that. But anyway. Um, but, First John five twenty. So it's it's all about the Lord. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him. Our Father in the heavens. We are in him that is true even in His Son, Jesus Christ, this, which I think everybody takes to mean Jesus, is the true God. The true God. Again, if you were being silly, you could say, well, then the Father is not the true God and the Holy Spirit is not the true God because Jesus is the true God. He's the true God in eternal life. That's Swedenborg's other favorite, favorite passage. He quotes it all the time. From the epistles. He loves that one. He's the true God. So, uh, how might I wrap this up, Lord? Um, the Lord said in John verse 10 about the door to the sheepfold and not climbing up some other way. The way that we get access to all that is in God or the Godhead or whatever you want to call that that's far above the heavens and the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. The way we get access is through 
Jesus Christ. You know, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Jesus Christ, in the Lord, in the risen Lord. That is the true God, an eternal life. Why does it say all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me? Well, that son, there's no eternally begotten son. You know, that, that's a mistake that, that uh, is in the Athanasian Creed and so forth. Uh, the son was born in time, you know, came into the flesh. So he didn't always have like that fleshly... Jesus had to go through a whole process, an entire process of regeneration to get to that point of, of being infilled with that divine love and becoming one with it, becoming united uh, with the Father. Uh, had to go through a whole process. So he didn't always have all power. All power is given to me. Not transferred. Like... And not transferred. Given, but not Shared. That's right. Shared. That's right. Because the Father has that. And you'll have some places where he'll say, why are you calling me good? None is good. But, the, but you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and yet he becomes the embodiment of that on this level. So he is the... Um, he is the, how can it be the God of heaven and earth. How can it be transferred when, he, when Jesus is the Lord? Well, because in some sense, like his soul always was, his soul was divine, but his flesh had hereditary evil, he, the stuff that he was working on, so there was a separation of a kind, and that's why he really is separate mm -hmm. from the Father. It, you know, that's why Scripture talks so often about the two, because he was quite, quite different to be, begin with and had to go through the same process we have to go through, shunning evils as sins, doing good, and so forth, and then having that infilled from within, from the Lord and everything. So uh, he, so he, even the outer self became divine. Even his physical self became divine, and uh, was eventually lifted up. But didn't start out there. And the other thing I want to say that I have to say here is that um, the earth is also. What is the earth generally code for? This is your second to last question of the evening. What is the earth? Code for in, in scripture, often. The lower self. That that was the answer that I was looking for. It, it it applies on many levels. The church is a is a very good answer too. Uh, the the earth is the outer self, and part of the beauty of what he did, I think, in some ways, he's always been Lord of the inner self. You know, but he became. God of heaven and earth. The other question is, you know, what are the heavens? The heavens are the inner self. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And this had to go through all this process to be, to be one with this. He's the God of both of those things. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for bringing us together. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us with the thoughts that you put in our hearts tonight, the sense of further things to explore. We thank you, Lord, for your presence with us, presence in this group, and also be with us, Lord, as we leave this group and as we read the word individually. We thank you for coming into the world for becoming the God of heaven and earth, all that that cost you, and the love that you have for us and wish to share with us as we go through our repentance and become one with you, Lord. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, friends. Big circle, huh?